Namo tasse bhagavato arato samma sambuddhase Namo tasse bhagavato arato samma sambuddhase Namo tasse bhagavato arato samma sambuddhase So today I thought I would continue speaking about more stories maybe stories with Bhante series this one will be a lot shorter. You might want to know how I was able to get permission from my parents. This is a story. It was not easy to get permission from my parents. So, a long time ago, a very, very long time ago, it must have been 1999, I was about to set out on my trip to go around the world. I had a plane ticket to go halfway around the world, all the way to Australia, and then from there I would go to Asia, India and Asia, and possibly look for places to ordain. So before I left, I asked my parents about the possibility of becoming a monk, and if I could have permission to ordain because you need permission to ordain from your parents. You need permission from your parents in order to ordain. It's one of the questions they ask you during your ordination ceremony. They ask you, do you have your parents' permission? And you have to say yes. And I knew this before, before I started on my trip, I knew that if I wanted to ordain, even as, uh, even as a temporary monk or something like that, I needed to get my permission, uh, my parents' permission. And so I asked my parents, can, can I ordain if, can I ordain, can I become a monk? Will you let me, will you give me permission? And my parents, they said, uh, probably, probably my mother said this, or maybe my father, they said, you know, you're over 18, you're an adult, you can make your own decisions. But don't ask us for permission, because we will not give you permission to ordain. So how am I supposed to, how am I supposed to decipher that if I have permission or not permission? Some said it would, it would be okay, some said it would not be okay. As I was traveling, I went on my trip, I was in some monasteries, I was reading Vinaya books, I was reading a lot of things, reading Abhidhamma, I was reading the suttas, reading the Dhammapada. I noticed that when, when they're reading, probably I think it was the Patimoka, or if they're giving, asking for permission from Sangha, they usually ask, they usually ask, if you agree, please remain silent, or uh, if you have this condition, please remain silent. And they ask you three times. In the Patimoka, they ask you, uh, are you pure? For the second time, are you pure? For the third time, are you pure? Everyone is silent, therefore, everyone is pure. Something like that, they say. And so I, I decided that that might be a way to get permission because my parents said, you're an adult, you can do whatever you want, but don't ask us for permission because we won't give it to you. And so I figured that they could keep their you know, principles in terms of not encouraging, encouraging me to do something that they didn't believe in, but yet I could still get permission. So we fast forward about a year and a half after that, I was traveling around the world. I was in so many places. Gosh, I was in, uh, visited a monastery in, in West Virginia, the Bhavana Society. I visited the uh, Abhayagiri. I visited Wat Metta. These are some of the big monasteries, especially at the time, where one could possibly ordain as a monk in America. 
But these didn't really appeal to me totally, and so I continued on my trip. I went to Hawaii, and I sort of uh, became a tourist more than a, someone who was set out to pick a place to ordain. So I went to Hawaii, I went to Fiji, I went to New Zealand, Australia, Hong Kong, India, Nepal, and then near the end of uh, my trip, I settled in at Wat Pa Nanacha. I think they say Wat Pa Nanacha. This is in Thailand. I arrived there the day before my, my 30th birthday. I wanted to be in a monastery while I was still, wanted to be set out to on the path to ordaining while I was still 29 because that's what the Buddha did. And I was ready to ordain there and the monk said that it was good enough for my getting permission. But eventually I decided to go to, this was maybe October, yeah of course it must have been, it was October 5th, the day before my birthday. It was October 5th, uh, 2000, year 2000. I'd left on my, on my journey, I think it was uh, uh, the end of September in 1999. And I was ordained as an Anagarika. I was following eight precepts in Thailand at Wat Panana Cha. And I had, uh, uh, I had a change of heart and I, I, I was reading uh, the most venerable Paul Oxido G's book, Knowing and Seeing. And I just felt like, oh my gosh, this is the most uh, incredible teacher that could ever exist, in this century at least. And I, I could recognize where he was pulling the teachings from. It was from the Abhidhamatta Sangaha and the Visuddhimagga. And I totally recognized that he was a teacher, a practical teacher, of this and I, I, I immediately wanted to go to go to Pa Ak and ordain and, and that's what I did. And I arrived there in 2001, I think it was 2001, yeah. And I wanted, I wanted to ordain and back then there was, there was maybe on average maybe 120 monks. Now there's probably over 600 uh, or just before the pandemic. I'm not really sure uh, what the population is now with the pandemic and with the political climate. But uh, at, that, uh, at that time, there was maybe 120 monks and uh, it, it had gone up to 600 uh, before all this uh, other stuff happened in 2019 and then later in, uh, in the current times. So there weren't many monks, there weren't many foreigners who went there and it was very easy to ordain. As a matter of fact, as soon as I said I was ready to ordain, I could ordain. As soon as I had robes and a bowl, I could ordain. There were just a couple of things I needed to do. One was to make sure that all my financial stuff was taken care of so that I wouldn't have to worry about money or bank accounts or anything and just uh, have everything taken away from me. The second thing was to make sure my credit card bills were paid off because that's how I was traveling and I had my mother as a signer on my bank account and she could pay my credit cards. And the last thing, of course, was to get permission from my parents. Now in those times, in those times, uh, Myanmar was on an embargo list. They were one of the, I think it was six countries that were embargoed. They're not on it now, actually, so we have a we have, uh, um, you know, North Korea, maybe Iran, uh, and uh, some, other, some other places, and Myanmar was one of those places. And they were, 
you could, you could feel, maybe Cuba was on that, you could feel that they were behind the times. And there wasn't really much internet. There wasn't much internet there. You might be able to send email through a special account. In order to make a telephone call, you had to go to like a telephone shop. You had to go to a shop that, that lets you make telephone calls. Not only that, you have to go to a special shop if you want to make an international call. So I had arranged everything. I had arranged everything, I think, somewhere down the line. I can't remember the order. The last, uh, one of the things I needed to do was get permission. And so I called my parents up. We had to go to a special shop. We had to go down the road. Um, we had to take a taxi to get there. And I called my parents and I asked them to call me back and they called me back. And I said, I said, I want to ordain, I'm ready to ordain, and I want to get permission to ordain because it's required. But I know, I know you don't want to give permission, so I got a plan. I'm going to ask you three times to get permission, that I want permission, and you will be silent for those three times, and then I will take that as permission. And uh, this was a really stressful phone call. And yeah, so the first time I asked, I said, I want to ordain. If you agree with this, please remain silent. And everything was silent, so it was good, just two more times. Mom and Dad, I want, I want to ordain. If you agree with this, please remain silent. And uh, then my father spoke up. And he says, no, I don't want you to ordain. At that time, I felt like my whole life was being taken away from me. I felt that all this that I was leading up to me becoming a monk was just riding on this, and it was my life. And of course, of course, it's something that's lasted uh, for quite a while. And I hope it lasts until my death. So I told, I told my parents, I said, do you know what this means if you don't give me permission? For me, it was like my life was gone. But I had read books about starving myself. Uh, There's some stories. Uh, in the, in the suttas and in the vinya, actually, about uh, not eating in order to get permission. But I wanted to live. I, I didn't want to die. I didn't want to die of starvation. I've read books on, on fasting for that purpose, how to, get, how to get permission or how to fast and live and survive it and then get permission. But I didn't do that. I told my parents, do you know what this means? Do you know what this means if you don't give me permission? And he said, what does it mean? And I said, you'll never see me again. You'll never, ever, ever see me again. Whether I'm hurt, whether I'm sick, whether I'm dying, whether I'm alive, whether I'm well, happy, sad, or sick or dying, I will never, ever speak with you again. And I was really, I mean, I'm, I'm saying this as a monk, I'm saying, <laughs> uh, but at that time, I was really, uh, we could say, fired up. And I was dead serious. I said, I'd never speak to you again. You would never know where I am. You know I know how to make money. But it didn't matter because I could, I could make money. I was, I was a computer programmer. And I just, I just said, you know, I'll be gone. I could stay gone. I will never come back or I will never tell you where I am. We will never speak again. And they knew it. They knew from the tone of my voice, from the situation of everything, calling from Myanmar, they knew that they would never see me again. And I told them, I said, you know, it would, you would not know if I'm alive or dead. And it would be better if you knew I was dead because at least you would know. I even told them that. 
I said, at least you would know I was dead, but you'll never know. You'll never know if I'm alive or if I'm dead or where I am or how I'm doing. I was serious, totally serious, and my mother knew it. And my father knew it. And my mother ordered my father off the telephone. She said, Herbie, get off the phone. I can, I can still... I can still hear her voice when she said that. Herbie, get off the phone. Now, I, sh I think she might have even, even said that. And my father got off the phone. And I continued with the questions, understanding that maybe my father had given up his right, or that he was silent, and he could pick up the phone again. But he knew that if he wasn't on the phone, I would take it as permission. Maybe that's not so legal in terms of getting permission and sangha, uh, sangha permission. When someone's not present, they give the chanda, they give the consent, and perhaps uh, in some ways it was legal or whatever. But it was legal enough, and I felt I had permission. I asked for the second time. Maybe I started over. I can't remember. It was maybe nearly 23 years ago. I said, for the first time, for the second time, for the third time, I want permission. If you agree, please remain silent. And I got my permission. And yeah, it was, it was very intense. And I really wanted this to happen. And I didn't want, I didn't want this, I didn't want anything to get in the way. And I didn't have to, <laughs> I didn't have to fast. <laughs> I didn't have to stop eating. That would have been difficult. But I did read books on that. So, yeah, I was able to get permission. And then I, I went through the ceremony and I believed I had permission enough to, to say uh, that I had permission during my ceremony. I'm really glad that I'm really glad that uh, that all that happened that I that my mother kicked my father off the phone and that I was able to believe that I had permission. But that's all that matters. I had to believe that I had permission. And I sort of did anyways. I was an adult. I could do whatever I want, but don't ask us for permission. So I definitely exceeded that part. And I'm glad that I, my mother did what she did, took control, uh, because perhaps, perhaps we wouldn't be talking at all. But most importantly, I wouldn't be a monk today if that didn't happen. And so my, my parents eventually they, they came to they came to like me becoming a monk. It took a, it took a long time, maybe about ten years, um, maybe maybe more than that. I think maybe the the trip uh, to Hawaii helped them uh, like the idea that I was an that I was a monk. And when I reordained, I, I had this uh, glitch in my uh, ordination, or I felt there was a glitch and we couldn't resolve it, and I had to reordain in 2007. I had to do a reordination ceremony. And I was in Sri Lanka. I was ready uh, to go through the process of reordaining. I was already a monk. I was still a monk, but I was going to Reordination, do a reordination and reset my seniority and just do it all over again. And actually it wasn't necessary, um, but uh, we didn't figure that out until a couple years ago. <laughs> but anyways, I, I would have to become, uh, I would have to reordain and I would need permission again. And I called my father. I called my father on the telephone and I said, I asked for my, where my mother was, and she was on some retreat center in, 
in Delaware, I think it was, and there was no cell, um, cell connections there. It wasn't a meditation retreat, it was just like some relaxation spa thing. And I told my father, you know, I'm, I'm going to ordain and I'm not going to threaten you like I did last time. And I was already a monk anyways. I just, maybe I wouldn't go through the ceremony or something. I'm not sure. I'm not sure what I would have done. But I said, you know, I was, I'm hoping I can get permission from you. And he said, yeah. Yeah, it's okay. You have permission. You have, you have permission and your mother is, is okay with it too. And I think, I remember also taking, making another phone call when I went to uh, the ordination place, and I probably talked to my mother anyways. And I was able either to get permission or believe I had permission. And so that's, that's how I got my permission to become a monk. Some people want to become monastics. And they might also have this barrier where they cannot get permission from the parents. No matter how old you are, you still need permission from the parents. Because we're always indebted to our parents and we have obligations to our parents. But when we are monks, some of that obligation, the material support, is not there. We still have obligations to teach the parents and to try to uh, teach them morality if they don't have morality to teach them generosity if they don't have generosity to teach them meditation if they don't have meditation to teach them wisdom if they don't have wisdom this is uh, one of the, the best ways is the wisdom and to teach them how to attain Nibbana They say that if we carry our, our parents, one, you know, mother on this shoulder, my father on this shoulder, if we were to carry them for a hundred years, uh, our debt to the parents would still not be fulfilled. And I... I am indebted to my parents and very grateful for my parents. Uh, they, they, uh, they raised me, they paid for college, they, <laughs> uh, they did a lot, of, a lot of things to help me uh, get where I am today. And so uh, we're, I'm very grateful for that. I'm very grateful that I got permission. Not only could I become a monk, but I'm also still in contact with my parents. We talk every week. So I hope that this can inspire you somehow, or if you need permission, maybe you can ask them for, ask them to remain silent and ask them three times. I don't, I don't recommend uh, threatening your parents like I did, but that's, that's what happened during the moment. Because I was, I was so dead set on becoming a monk. And so I hope that this can inspire you. I hope that you can uh, take some of this story, maybe perhaps take on robes and become a monk with your parents' blessing so that you can practice, can practice the, the morality that the monks have to practice, the sila, patimoka. 227 rules. To practice that so that you can have a mind that's clear for samadhi, using that calmness of concentration and samadhi to develop wisdom, to see the conditioned reality, realities that everything is impermanent, suffering, and non-self, and so that you can reach Nibbana safely and quickly. Sadhu, sadhu, sadhu.